Today we're looking at Azerbaijan, the country that is on the Caspian Sea and is very rich because of oil. The news broke this week that the car industry in the UK has been sending a lot more cars to Azerbaijan and the industry is um, basically stated it has nothing to do with the Russian invasion of Ukraine. But here on this map from Sky News, you can see very clearly the invasion began and car imports into Azerbaijan from the UK spiked incredibly high, even though the um, GDP of UK um, of Azerbaijan has not really changed that much. Here is a map of the GDP per capita. So they're still as rich as they were before the war, and yet they're suddenly demanding way, way, way more cars in the UK. Yeah, so a lot of people are saying that that is probably cars being sent to Russia via Azerbaijan. Um, maybe to be expected, but there you go, an interesting story all the same. Azerbaijan is an interesting country. It is the country that have had the first um, oil production site in the world. This is a famous oil well right here, the world's first industrially um, operational oil well. And yes, yeah, some very fancy buildings around there. The oil from the country and the gas basically pays for all of the government uh, expenditure. And it's a little bit of a, I think it is in fact a dictatorship. If I remember correctly, the score for freedom is very low in that country. Let's quickly double check that number. Um, yeah, total score at the Freedom House Index of seven, so not free. I um, I'm aware that basically oil is their entire economy and that the oil company that is basically a state company is run in a very, I suppose, not, not in a very transparent manner. So the oil money and the way it gets spent can be a bit questionable. Azerbaijan, of course, is home to the uh, Baku Grand Prix, um, the Azerbaijan Grand Prix from Formula One. And most of the nations these days that do end up getting the Formula One contract spend a lot of money in order to get that privilege. So again, the oil money probably flowing into that. Interesting thing about Azerbaijan is the oil fields. I'm not sure exactly, I was trying to research this, if these lines are connected to the oil industry or not. I have a feeling that they could be. They're like these kind of platforms out to these rigs. Um, you know, these don't look like your typical oil rig, but these look like pipelines in my opinion. Um, again, I'm not entirely certain. Just very interesting inf infrastructure out here in the Caspian Sea. I will go through a few more of these. And they, again, this is the, the oil well in its location beside this very fancy stadium. Um, this is another map trying, for me trying to understand where the oil lines are coming from. But you can kind of see that there is a lot of pipelines in the water out there. Um, this is the oil field a little bit further east. And you can see here are some actual oil rigs. Again, a bit poor on the imagery. These ones are a bit better to see. I always find these types of equipment very impressive. Apparently, Azerbaijan managed to get an awful lot of uh, foreign direct investment in the years, um, I think from 2000 onwards, that's kind of put a big jump into their production. In the 18 to exactly which years i think it was 1901 azerbaijan actually produced more oil than the united states we can probably find that i have it here somewhere between 1898 and 1901 baku produced more oil than the united states um by 1901 half the world's oil was produced within 1900 wells located within six square miles of baku so it just shows that oil is literally just probably falling seeping out of the ground there i um, mean huge amounts um, yeah, I have one more picture here of an oil refinery, the Sokar refinery, that is the state company, the state oil company of Azerbaijan. And you can just see the massive tanks that they have here. An interesting thing about all this oil is that a lot of it goes to Italy, um, according to this information about the economy of Azerbaijan. If you look at the exports, the highest country in the export list for oil and gas is Italy at 46%. That was a big surprise to me. I didn't fully understand and I haven't really understood that yet. Is all of that oil going to Italy specifically? A lot of it goes through a pipeline to the Mediterranean. It goes through Turkey. Um, I have a map of that pipeline here. Um, petroleum pipelines in Europe. And that particular pipeline is the Baku to Tbilisi uh, pipeline. And Sehan, I can't pronounce it properly. That is in Turkey there. You can see the route going through here. Look at the way it goes around Armenia into Georgia and open across. And apparently um, Georgia and Turkey make quite a lot of money from the pipeline in transit fees. I think up to 200 million for Turkey. Um, I forget what year that was, but it was in dollars. It's mentioned here somewhere um, in that region anyway. Let's take another quick look at the defenses that Azerbaijan uses to defend itself. Um, so it does have a Navy in order to protect its oil rigs. Um, you can see here some, some military boats of different descriptions. I I'm not entirely sure what they are, are they cruisers or whatever, but they definitely look like military equipment to me. And then a little bit further to the right here, we see some oil tankers. Um, I believe they are oil tankers anyway, coming in to get filled up from the tanks on shore there. Yeah, 
Um, another thing about the um, Azerbaijanis is that they spent a lot on fighter jets. I think they're going to be buying some new fighter jets. I think these ones could be Russian ones, but they're going to buy new ones from Turkey up in Pakistan. That was announced this year as well. Um, they, of course, had their war with Armenia, and that's kind of calmed down now. Um, seems like the Azerbaijanis came well out on top on, uh, on that one after Russia wasn't able to uh, kind of protect Armenia in the way it used to, um, having been quite preoccupied in Ukraine. One last thing that is quite nice about um, Baku is it has these amazing medieval walls. And you can kind of see the shape of it here around the uh, old city. I quickly put something on the ground here to also show it to you. Just amazing architecture. And you can see this in the Formula One Grand Prix. They drive through these walls um, on a very tight corner, actually, which yeah, gets people quite um, nervous watching it. But quite a beautiful sight, it has to be said. And one last thing I saw in the countryside is these interesting oxbow lakes. So this is the river, Kura River. You can kind of see it's kind of a, a darker, kind of like a grayer color there. And this river used to go into all of these oxbow lakes. And over time, it has just kind of um, become, I suppose it's cut a, a quicker way, a quicker path through. We can kind of see an example of this, um, where this would have been taking effect. Here, you can kind of see that river would have used to have gone in it angle through there through there and then through different parts and they've probably also dug out parts of it to make it more effective too um, but i just find these different parts of the landscape quite interesting and i think i saw more of our here we go you can kind of see these again if you didn't know what they were they look a bit like alien uh, markings but again as someone so friendly um was to describe them in the brazil video that i made these are yeah irrigation systems um because yeah you can kind of see these circles that are made there to irrigate the landscape interesting the different colors there um, I wonder are they not in operation at the moment or is it a wintertime picture but let's see can we go a bit further down just seems like soil to me yeah we can't see too well okay yeah, again some interesting pictures of the Azerbaijan landscape so I'm going to quickly go into some of the um, economics um, we already looked a bit about the pipeline about the car scandal um, you see who they import most of their stuff from is from Russia Turkey and China oh yeah something I didn't fully understand was how did the cars that are going to Russia getting to Azerbaijan because you can't really send them by boat that well I'd imagine that there isn't much access through the Black Sea to send them that way so are they all being sent by truck are they coming by a boat as far as here and then going by truck to Azerbaijan and from there into Russia that's an interesting one um, remember it's from the UK that they're coming from so either they're being driven all the way across there which is quite a quite a long distance and must add a bit of extra cost to the cars that are eventually ending up in Russia or they're going by boat through there just something to keep in mind I don't see a direct easy route for that to happen um, yeah yeah um, let's see anything else particularly interesting the amount of crew that is produced in the country went up a lot in 2003 so I think that's when a lot of the investment actually happened um, and that's been kind of dra gradually dropping along there um, there was an interesting graph actually here about the amount of oil that is considered to be still um, available to be, I suppose, found in the Caspian Sea. World's estimated undiscovered oil resources in 2012. Caspian Sea is more than Europe, double the amount than in Europe. Interesting how Europe is so dry in terms of oil um, and gas compared to other regions, and yet it's one of the richest places in the world. It's just an interesting kind of a contradiction, actually. Um, North America, extremely high for the size that it is. Um, former Soviet Union, I suppose that includes Russia, pretty high as well for one country to be, well, if we assume just Russia has most of that, um, Asia and Pacific, South American, Caribbean, Sub-Saharan Africa, that's quite impressive, but of course this is probably estimated, so they don't really know, um, world's estimate undiscovered gas resources, also Caspian Sea, quite a big amount considering the size of the area, it's not really that big. In terms of fragility, um, yeah, as we're trying to swipe there in the middle, is the 76th most fragile country in the world by this estimate, um, which is fair enough. Looking again at just the numbers for the uh, energy production, they produce a lot more than they consume. Um, I think that's five times more. And yeah, that's all gas and oil. No coal, interestingly enough. And basically, they didn't never bother with renewables because they don't need to. And they probably don't have a lot of hydro opportunity compared to other countries. Um, but again, I didn't take that too closely. This is just an interesting one too. Caspian Basin's oil production toward house in 2012. And that dark blue one there is Azerbaijan offshore. Uh, 
so yeah, kind of showing that most of the Caspian Sea production in the actual water is coming from Azerbaijan. Where is their gas? I believe is actually onshore. Um, this is the gas production graph. Azerbaijan offshore is brown. Uh, Azerbaijan onshore. Okay, there you go. So we actually have a bit of a mixture, and you can see how that's increased and increased over the years as they developed that system. Um, in terms of electricity, this was interesting. This is Azerbaijan. Earlier on today, they were actually importing electricity from Russia, and now today they're exporting um, a few hours later. But of course, that can change in a couple of minutes. It just depends on what the uh, the rates are at the time. And uh, there, that's Russia exporting into Georgia. Um, in terms of doing business, Azerbaijan ranks quite well, the thirty fourth in the world. So clearly, it's not that difficult to set up a business there. Of course, it is, from my understanding, um, not a democracy. Let's quickly check: is it a king or a dictator? Um, Azerbaijan. Um, let's call it government system. It's governed by municipalities. Yes, it's preserved by Azerbaijan democracy. And not the politics take place in an authoritarian system where elections are not free and fair, political opponents are repressed, civil rights are limited, human rights abuses are widespread, corruption is rampant, power is concentrated in the hands of the president and his extended family, who of course owns all the oil as well, it being a state owned company. So just to have that made clear, good to know. Um, this is an interesting one. So this is the uh, electricity produced from natural gas resources, and that's really climbed since 2000. And just take a, this, take a look at this shape and keep that in your mind. When we compare it to the oil, it's the exact opposite. So the amount of electricity produced from oil has dropped and has even reached zero in 2013, and it's kind of climbed to 6.5% again. But when we compare those graphs, it's basically every drop in one is an increase in the other directly. Look at that 2000 to 2001 big rise and a big fall 2000 2001 a very proportionate fall as well um, in terms of GDP again to look at the fact that um, GDP even though it has been rising it hasn't um, now is this in relation to the cars coming in probably not the only reason I mean a lot of well here is your COVID dip anyway and their rise has been much bigger than their dip according to this graph um, so that's just an interesting thing to keep in mind 85% rise very curious, of course, if Russia is buying oil from them or, well, of course, Russia would want to be selling oil. They wouldn't be that interested in buying. So I'm not entirely sure what it is, but it's a good thing to think about. We already looked at that. World Bank data here about the uh, GDP again. This is a different, um, this is the, the, yeah, sorry, that's, that's the debt. I don't think I have a GDP one open right now. Oh yeah, here we go. Real GDP growth. Um, this is a bit, I find a bit confusing with these trading graphs is this one is showing an increase, whereas this one here is showing a um, actual slight decline in real GDP growth. So you would expect that to have been much higher if they were buying 2,000% more cars from the UK and probably other countries as well that have put sanctions on the uh, on Russia. So a yeah, curious story, that one. Let's take a quick look, though, at that um, government debt. Pretty low, relatively low. They have enough oil. They probably don't need to, um, yeah, since it's... No, democracies are not spending as much on um, infrastructure for the people, etc. Probably so they don't need to be borrowing as much, and they have the oil to pay it off anyway if they do borrow. Um, this is a, one about the inflation rate. They clearly experienced hyperinflation in 1955. I think that was around one of the wars with Armenia as well. It would have been close at that time. That's one thousand six, yeah, one point six thousand, uh, one thousand six hundred percent, I suppose. Pretty crazy hyperinflation. They must have done something to reset themselves, and since then they've experienced good inflation on some years. Um, yeah, let's kind of zoom in a bit. And then they've had these weird kind of ups and downs, and they've brought it right down to 1%. That's quite impressive. Not many countries have gotten down that quick. And I did just find something from the Central Bank of Azerbaijan, a statement on the uh, policy, monetary policy in 2023. Um, a thought that just came to my mind was there was a big increase in gas prices, actually, and also oil prices during the U uh, Ukraine war. Beginning, so that would have, of course, been good for the uh, economy of Azerbaijan in terms of you know, higher money coming in for them for less product being sold. And um, this is a statement from the central bank. Um, the central bank operated in the environment of ongoing geopolitical tension in the world, weaker global economic activity, um, shrunk access to global finance due to tightened monetary policy, etc. etc. In general, the international conjuncture was favorable for Azerbaijan in terms of the balance of payments, current account surplus, and non oil gas economic growth continued as well. That's, of course, that would be very important that they don't end up with a Dutch disease issue and that they do um, basically make sure their other parts of their economy are also looked at, even though I feel like that's probably not entirely the case there, um, as much as it should really be happening for a well-diversified economy. They kind of go into lots of details about the different parts of the world that are having issues. Um, 
here I think it talks about the US growth being revised upwards and EU growth. Uh, here we go. The purchasing index shows the economic trends in the manufacturing increase in the USA and the increase in the euro area in September compared to the beginning of the year. Um, of course, that would be Germany um, having issues. And it talks about all the different yeah, forecasts for different parts of the world. Nothing too specific on Ansel Berzang, though, or its inflation rate. So quite interesting graphs here, and there's lots of interesting details about the, um, the country and its economic outlook. Last thing I wanted to look at was the uh, climate change map here, which basically says everything is fine. There's not ever, ever going to be any flooding due to the fact that the Caspian Sea is not connected to the global um, yeah, to the global ice, I suppose. The water isn't going to rise here as it will in the oceans and other places. In terms of population, everybody lives in Baku. That's what this map kind of suggests. Yeah, really high population growth there. And yeah, this is the conflict tracker just highlighting the conflict in yeah, Nagorno-Karabakh, which is, according to this statement, improving since uh, Armenia aren't putting up much of a resistance at the moment uh, with the current situation there. So yeah, that was just our look at Azerbaijan. I haven't looked at this country ever before, um, so everything I learned today was actually quite new for me, and I found it quite interesting. Definitely is a country that is very reliant on oil. Let's see if they can diversify, and let's see what happens with those car imports from Britain as well.